as we get started with some quick housekeeping here, that would be great. So hi everybody and welcome to today's webinar on the role of dams in the nearshore phosphorus or nearshore zone on phosphorus flows along the river lake interface. This is the second in webinar in our Lake Futures webinar series. My name is Kirsten Grant and I am the project coordinator for Lake Futures, which is a project based out of the University of Waterloo. But like many of you here, I am joining you from my home today. So I first wanted to start by acknowledging that we are all participating today from traditional territories of the first people across this country. I'm currently in Sarnia, Ontario, and acknowledge that the land which I am on is traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people, specifically of Amjanong First Nation. I would also encourage you to take a moment to recognize the traditional land that you are on as well. Philippe, if you could go to the next slide. So today's event is being hosted by Lake Futures based out of the University of Waterloo. And this project is led by Dr. Nandita Basu, who we heard from last week, if you were able to join us. This project involves over 20 researchers from four different universities. It is a seven year long multidisciplinary project that aims to deliver adaptive watershed and lake management solutions that minimize trade-offs between lake ecosystems, water uses, and economic growth. So as we finish up year three of the project, we decided to create this webinar series to connect our findings um, with external practitioners and researchers. Our goal of this series is to share our latest research findings but also to discuss implications for how this research could be used to inform water policies, programs, and plans in Ontario and beyond, and to promote dialogue between researchers, partners, and stakeholders to inform the next phase of our research program. Lake Futures is a project under the Global Water Futures Program, which is the world's largest university-led water research program with the goal of delivering risk management solutions for managing water in Canada and other cold regions, informed by leading edge water science. Uh, Philippe, if you could switch to the next slide. So some quick logistics before we get started, we'll ask that you please use the Q&A feature to post to all questions. Um, feel free to do that throughout the talk and we will get to those in the Q&A session. You're also welcome to use the chat box to share general comments, ideas, and engage in the dialogue, um, and also to introduce yourself to others who might be on the webinar. Finally, this webinar will be recorded and will be made available for later viewing. Today's format will begin with a presentation from Dr. Philippe Van Capellen, followed by a Q&A. So we're hoping for this to be a two-way conversation, but we do recognize that this can be a challenge in this format. So as the presentation goes on, we encourage you to ask questions and to share your thoughts. Um, but to begin, we would like to do a quick poll of those joining our webinar today to help us gauge our audience. So if you could choose now which best represents your organization, whether that's government, NGOs, industry and consulting, academic institution, or if you're an other, if we missed your main category. We'll just keep that up for a couple more moments. And like you, I can also see the results of this poll. So it's nice to see we have a good representation from academic institutions, 63%, um, but also lots of folks from government, 24%. NGOs and industry consultants and a few others in there. So a nice mix of agencies and interests joining us today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Philippe Van Capellen is a professor in Earth and Environmental Science at the University of Waterloo and is the Canada Excellence Research Chair Laureate in Ecohydrology. He is a co-investigator on the Lake Futures Project and leads the Lake Futures Integration Team. So, Philippe, take it away. Thank you, Kirsten. <clears throat> also, thank you for all the attendees. Um, it's the first time I give a webinar of this, in this format, so it's also the first experience here. 
So I will talk about dams and near shore zones and how they influence phosphorus flows along the river lake continuum. And of course, the focus on phosphorus reflects its importance as a limiting or co-limiting nutrient of primary production in many freshwater ecosystems. So obviously a lot of people have been involved in this, uh, in this research, but I would particularly want to acknowledge the uh, graduate students and the postdoctoral fellows who have contributed most of the materials I will show you today. <clears throat> so let's start with, uh, with river damming and let's start from, from a global perspective. Uh, and that's why I say here it's a global phenomena. And just to give you a few statistics, there's likely over 16 million dams worldwide. We don't know the exact number because a lot of dams are not necessarily registered. Of those 16 millions, definitely more than 50,000 are considered to be large dams, so dams that are larger or higher than uh, 15 meters. But the exact number is probably close to 70,000 at, uh, at the present time. So they cover together these large dam reservoirs over 400,000 square kilometers. And to just to give you kind of that, or to put that in perspective, if you take the Laurentian Great Lakes, so all five Great Lakes together, they cover about 240,000 square kilometers. The volume of dam reservoirs is about seven times the volume of rivers. But what is probably more relevant is when we look at how much of the global river catchment area is actually draining into large dams. And the estimates for 1970 is about 18%. By the turn of the century, that grew to about 27%, and by 2030, about a third of the global river catchment area will actually drain into one or several dams. Another telling uh, statistic is that by 2030, 90% of all the rivers will be fragmented by one or more dams. And that's in most countries. In fact, we have dams on all continents except Antarctica. It's also true for Ontario. I just here, this is for um, Ontario Power. They operate 241 dams in the province, and that's only a fraction of all the dams in the province of Ontario. So the question we really are trying to answer, or have been trying to answer, is how damming is changing riverine nutrient fluxes. <clears throat> and so if we think about it, uh, let's take a very simplistic view of a river. So nutrients are delivered from the landscape into the river, and then the river transports these nutrients from upstream to downstream. Now, of course, that's a simplified view of what the river does because of course they have in-stream processes like nutrient spiraling, et cetera, that will actually modify in-stream these nutrient fluxes. But if we start building a dam on that river, then we essentially transform part of the upstream reach of that river into something that's actually more between a river and a lake. And in particular, as soon as you have that, you fill your reservoir, the flow rates will decrease, the, resonance, the water resonance time will increase, the suspended matter will start uh, settling down, light penetration will be uh, deeper, algae start growing, they start taking up nutrients, they produce biomass, some of that biomass settles down, it gets mineralized, etc. So in other words, it sets into motion a lot of biogeochemical cycling, very similar to what we actually see in, in, in natural lakes. So if you think about it, if we take, for instance, the uh, nutrient elements phosphorus and uh, silicon, what we have is we have the river bringing in uh, phosphorus and silicon under various forms, part of which, which are bioavailable and reactive. So part of that was taken up by the algae or by benthic uh, organisms. Uh, it settles down, it mineralizes, but some of that phosphorus and silicon will over time accumulate in the sediments uh, in, at the bottom of the reservoir. So there will be a net retention or a net elimination of phosphorus and silicon from the water column. And therefore we expect that in the outflow of the dam, there will be less phosphorus and less silicon than in the river flow that came into the reservoir. And this is borne out by uh, most studies on phosphorus and silicon and reservoir budgets. Indeed, we see this net retention happening. For nitrogen and also for carbon, it's a little bit more complicated because in addition to what the river is bringing in, you can also, there's also extra sources of carbon through photosynthesis, so uptake of CO2 from the atmosphere, and for nitrogen through nitrogen fixation. In addition, not all the elimination is through burial in sediments or outflow to the dam. You can also have gaseous emissions to, to the atmosphere. Another form, for instance, of CO2, methane, uh, dinitrogen, and uh, nitrous oxide. So for nitrogen and carbon, in some cases, you can actually have more nitrogen in the outflow than came into the inflow. But the bottom line is that when we look at dams, they modify the riverine flux of nutrients. They also tend to decouple them. And what I mean by that is that if you think back about the little the two schematics I just showed you, is that we have certainly a modification of the total river flows, 
But because of the vital chemical processes in the reservoir, we also have changes in the chemical speciation, chemical forms of these nutrients, and therefore also in the bioavailability. But the different chemical elements undergo different types or different, different processes. So the biogeochemistry is very different between, for instance, uh, carbon and phosphorus. And therefore, dams will also alter nutrient ratios that are delivered by rivers to the receiving water bodies, for instance, a lake. So in other words, before the dam, we might have a certain delivery, relative delivery of phosphorus and nitrogen. After the dam has been established, that ratio might actually change. And that can actually change which nutrient is actually starting to limit or become the limiting nutrient for primary production. So the main message here is what goes into a reservoir is not what goes out of the reservoir. And an important property of the reservoir that will determine by how much the reservoir will affect nutrient, uh, river and nutrient fluxes is, of course, the water residence time. If you have a very short water residence time, it means that the water comes into the reservoir, flushes through the reservoir, gets out of the reservoir. So there's very, very little time for biogeochemical processing to take place. On the other hand, if you have a very long water residence time, then there's a lot of time, there's a lot of processing that can take place. And the water flowing out of the reservoir can have a very different chemistry from the water coming into the reservoir. And so an example of the latter, for instance, is Lake Diefenbaker. It's one of the largest, or while it was the largest, you know, it's one of the largest uh, reservoirs in Canada. It's in Saskatchewan. It's on the South Saskatchewan River. Uh, it's a very long reservoir. It's, uh, the total length is over 200 kilometers. One particularity is also that there's two dams at the outflow, one at the top here, the Gardner Dam over here, and then the Capel Dam down here. But what I really want to point out is the fairly long water residence time of 1.1 year. So, and for reservoirs, that, that's, that's kind of a long, uh, a long uh, residence time. So what we can calculate from data is what we call the percent retention. And essentially what we compare is how much of, for instance, phosphorus is entering the reservoir versus how much is leaving the reservoir. And for this Lake Diefenbaker, where it's because of the long residence time, we have a lot of processing taking place. If we look at the average annual retentions for reactive phosphorus, you can think about that as the, the fraction of the total phosphorus that is bioavailable. We find that the retention or the elimination in the reservoir is over 80%. It's, it's actually close to 90% in most years. If you look down at reactive silicon, that's kind of 30% uh, retention, so much lower than for phosphorus. And for dissolved nitrogen, actually, it's close to zero. In some years, it's a positive retention, a little positive retention. Other years, it's a little negative retention. So we see these huge differences. They're very well pronounced for uh, Lake Diefenbaker because of the long water residence time. But overall, this is often what we see for reservoirs. They tend to be more efficient at retaining or eliminating phosphorus than silicon, than nitrogen. And so therefore we can expect that also at a global scale, we will have essentially uh, this effect. And so that's shown here for a global analysis. So what you see here are the nitrogen to phosphorus ratios, atom by atom, in river water, global average river water. And you can see there's data here for, or there's uh, estimations for 1970, for 2000, and then we have projections for 2030 and for 2050, according to different uh, environmental scenarios. But what I really want to point is the fact that you have, and for each estimation, a yellow bar and a green bar, and that systematically the green bars are higher than the yellow bars. So the green bars are our estimates of the global average nitrogen to phosphorus ratio in river water when we take into account the effect of dams. When we take out the effect of dams, we get the yellow bars. And you can see that essentially by putting in dams on rivers, we increase the nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. So one way to think about that is that we, the dams or the effect of dams on river water is to increase the availability of nitrogen over phosphorus, or alternatively, to deplete phosphorus relative to nitrogen. And therefore, dams globally tend to promote phosphorus limitation. So an environment, and particularly nearshore marine environments, are often in a pristine natural state are nitrogen limited. But by building dams on the rivers that discharge in these environments, we can actually, and this has actually been observed, push them towards phosphorus limitation. But also certainly for freshwater ecosystems, this is one factor that helps explain why most freshwater ecosystems are also phosphorus limited. Okay, so now this is a global analysis. That's all fine and well. It's just kind of the general context. But oh, if we're thinking about nutrient enrichment and we want to do something about nutrient enrichment um, uh, consequences, such as eutrophication or algal blooms, we have to obviously act more locally, more regionally. 
And so I will deal now with some data that we assembled on Fanshawe Lake or Fanshawe Reservoir uh, and Fanshawe Dam. So to situate you, here is um, here on A here is the, the dam location. So that's Fanshawe Dam. We have Lake Huron, Lake Erie, Lake St. Clair, and the Fanshawe Dam is located on the Thames River that Ontario that essentially uh, discharges here in Lake St. Clair. And here we are, I am here in Kitchener over, over here. So the brownish reddish area that you see here is the drainage base, the drainage area for this, uh, for Fanshawe Lock. So they're all located, so Fanshawe is loc located in the upper Thames. It's a fairly old reservoir. It was built in the 50s. It's a relatively small reservoir, but what I really want to point out here is the average water residence time is on the order of 10 days. So it's of course much shorter than what we saw for Lake Diefenbaker. So we also expect the effects maybe on phosphorus retention or phosphorus elimination to be less than for Lake Diefenbaker. So this was part of the master's thesis of Nedi, uh, Nedi Kau. And so what you see here, so what he did essentially was for two years, 2018 and 2019, he went out every month with colleagues to collect samples upstream from the dam, uh, upstream from the reservoir, in the reservoir, and downstream of the dam. And so what you see in these two panels are the results or the annual phosphorus retentions that he estimated from his data for 2018 and 2019. Within each year, you can see uh, results for TP, for total phosphorus, for particulate phosphorus, and for dissolved reactive phosphorus. What you also see is these different colored bars. Those actually correspond to different methods to estimate loads. Now, ideally, you would have continuous discharge measurements and continuous concentration measurements, and then you could exactly calculate what your phosphorus loads would be. But since we only have data, concentration data each month, we have to kind of fill in the time in between the, the time points of measurements. And that's done through using certain mathematical uh, methods. And there's quite a few of these methods have been presented in the literature, so we tried here four of these different methods. And so what you see, if you look at these graphs, is quite some variability. First of all, you see variability between the years. The numbers of the retention efficiencies of phosphorus tend to be higher in 2019 and 2018. We see some differences between the, uh, the different species, although not very pronounced. But what we see mostly is differences between these load estimation methods. And so, in other words, the way you estimate your loads brings in a certain amount of uncertainty. And ultimately, the only way to, to eliminate this uncertainty will be to have higher frequency uh, concentration measurements. But if we take all the results together, and if we look particularly at total phosphorus retention, well, in 2018, anything between 20 and 39% of the total phosphorus was retained in the, by the reservoir. In 2019, it was actually higher, probably anything between 27 to 58%. So actually, Taken into account the, the relatively small size of the reservoir and its relatively short residence time, it's actually still a very important sink for phosphorus. So in principle, that's good news for the downstream part of the Thames River and ultimately uh, Lake St. Clair because it means that all that phosphorus that accumulates in the reservoir is not making its way um, down the river. But this is for the annual phosphorus retention. So we can also take a more, we can also start resolving the data according to season. So here what you see, we start here in winter 2018 all the way to the fall 2019. So these are again total phosphorus retention efficiencies in percent, but now for winter, spring, summer, and fall. And what you see is a very clear seasonality in this retention. And what is particularly, um, uh, what you can particularly see here is that in the summer months, both in 2018 and 2019, and actually also in the spring, in the late spring of 2018, we have negative retentions. So what that means is actually there's a net export of phosphorus. There's more phosphorus coming out of the reservoir than actually goes into the reservoir by the upstream river. So in the winter and fall, we have net phosphorus retention. In the summer, we have net phosphorus export. And the spring is kind of variable. Now, do remember that uh, although we have uh, net export in the summer, those actually apply to relatively small phosphorus loads while in the winter and the fall we have higher loads and that's why on an annual integrated or an annual basis we actually have net retention of phosphorus in the uh, in the reservoir so this is kind of interesting so of course we want to know why we have net export during the summer but in addition to the net export in the summer we also see a higher bioavailability of the phosphorus exiting the reservoir than entering the reservoir 
And so as a measure of bioavailability, we use here the ratio of the dissolved reactive phosphorus over the total phosphorus. So that's the fraction, that's the highly bioavailable fraction of the total phosphorus. So here are the results for summer 2018 and for summer 2019. Uh, again, so that's that ratio. Each little box here corresponds to one of these uh, load estimation methods. Uh, but the trends are very similar. If you look here, we have the upstream ratio of the RP to TP compared to the downstream. So that's, this is what comes in, this is what goes out, comes in, goes out, comes in, goes out. We see systematically that this ratio is higher in the outflow than in the inflow. So somehow what is happening in the reservoir makes that the proportion of of um, reactive phosphorus or bioavailable phosphorus that comes out of the, uh, of the reservoir is higher than what actually comes in. And so the reason for that is really that in the summer, there's summer stratification. So the, the, uh, the, there's a thermal stratification of the reservoir that is shown here. This is from another master student, Sheng De Yu. And what is, what is shown here is the dissolved oxygen concentration. If we were plotting the temperature, we see something very similar. So during the winter and the spring, the reservoir is well mixed, but then in the summer we get thermal stratification, and one consequence of that is oxygen depletion in the deepest part of the reservoir close to the dam. And so this oxygen depletion, you can also see, tends to be more intense in 2019 than it is in 2018. Okay, so we get hypoxic or anoxic conditions. And we can also see that the, the, what I just showed you were model calculations, uh, here again is for the deepest part of the lake, the bottom water oxygen concentration. The line is the model calculations. And then the triangles that you see here are measured data. You see that model actually does a very good job in simulating this oxygen depletion or this summer stratification. So that then brings us to the internal loading versus external loading of phosphorus. So if you have a, a reservoir, you have the external loading, that's the phosphorus that's brought in from outside the reservoir, so mostly in this case by river inflow, a little bit of atmospheric deposition. Uh, then we have processing of this phosphorus in water column. Some particulate phosphorus gets deposited at the bottom of the reservoir. And in the surface sediments, we have degradation and dissolution process taking place. And that produces or generates dissolved reactive phosphorus that can then, be, then essentially move back into the water column. And that's what we call internal loading. Whatever is not regenerated and returned as internal loading ultimately gets buried in the deeper sediment. It's essentially permanently removed from the system. And so uh, when we deal with lakes or with reservoirs, one of the things we typically want to know is what is the importance of internal loading versus external loading. But what is most important at this point now is that internal phosphor loading also depends on bottom water oxygen concentrations. In a system where you have oxygen present at the bottom of the reservoir of the lake, what we see is that the dissolved reactive phosphorus that's produced in the sediments actually is retained in the sediment because there is this oxidized surface layer, in particular it tends to be rich in iron oxide, that act as little sponges for the dissolved reactive phosphorus. So it actually keeps, it forms a barrier that prevents most of that dissolved reactive phosphorus that's generated from actually leaving the sediments. If the oxygen disappears, like for instance during some stratification, this oxidized layer dissolves away and the phosphorus can then become essentially released to the water column. So essentially what is happening is that, and this is for 2018, so day one is January 1st, and the last day is December 31st. The line that you see here is the oxygen concentration. Here we have our summer, early fall stratification and oxygen depletion. And the red here indicates the relative importance of the internal phosphorus loading. And so during the summer, about 80% of the phosphorus entering the water column is actually this is all reactive phosphorus that is being released by the sediments to the water column. And that is why then that, of course, feeds into the outflow to the dam. And that is why we have this increased proportion of dissolved reactive phosphorus in the outflow of the dam. But essentially what we see here is that the processing, the biogeochemical processing of the phosphorus in the reservoir is essentially changing the speciation, the chemical forms, or the proportion of the different chemical forms, and therefore the overall bioavailability of phosphorus coming out. What we also see is that this processing can also be seen in this classic concentration discharge relationship. So what you see here is in the vertical axis, the concentration of dissolved reactive phosphorus plotted versus the discharge. And this is the data that you saw, or the points you see here is for the inflow. It's coming, that's the upstream river. And what you see is this positive correlation. It's not a perfect correlation, but at least you see this positive slope. It's an enrichment uh, relationship. 
And this is what you often see in headwaters, where essentially at the high discharges, we see the highest concentrations of phosphorus. And the reason for that is relatively well understood. It's high discharges correspond to events, high precipitation events, high surface runoff, and therefore the surface runoff picks up the phosphorus from the surface layers of the, the soil and delivers it to the river. If we now exa do exactly the same, but we look at the outflow, we get this relationship, a completely different relationship. In fact, we get uh, essentially a plot of, uh, cloud of data points that essentially shows very little dependence of the concentration on the discharge. We call this a chemostatic relationship. But essentially what this means is that we have, well, the, the explanation here is that these low discharges are associated with the summer stratification, where essentially internal loading becomes very important, therefore delivers more dissolved reactive phosphorus to the water column and to the, to the outflow. But essentially, when you look at a picture like that for somebody who works on the chemistry of river water, it means that because of the reservoir and because of the processing in the reservoir, we have a fundamental rearrangement of the phosphorus dynamics of the river system. We go from this enrichment relationship to a chemostatic relationship. So this is a signature. You could think about it as an integrated signature of all the processes that tend to affect the dynamics of phosphorus in the reservoir and therefore affect what comes out of the reservoir. All right, <clears throat> so if we now follow the Thames River, we ultimately end up in Lake St. Clair. The discharge point is somewhere here, I think. And you can kind of see this plume here, this is chlorophyll A. So you can see that essentially by discharging phosphorus in Lake St. Clair, it helps feed this algal bloom. And so <clears throat> and just here for the location of Lake St. Clair, it's between Lake Huron and Lake Erie. So we have the, the, the St. Clair uh, River Channel that connects Lake Huron to Lake St. Clair, and then here we have the Detroit River, which is a channel connecting um, the uh, Lake St. Clair to Lake Erie. So you can think about Lake St. Clair are one of another transition point in the phosphorus coming down the Thames River. And so what Sergei Bokanyov, who was here for a couple of years as a postdoc, uh, working with Don Scavia, did was to say, okay, well, here's my Lake St. Clair. We kind of know what the inputs of phosphorus are and what the we, we can essentially simulate also very nicely the hydrodynamics in the system. He asked the question, well, of all the phosphorus that is brought in by the Thames River, how much of it actually reaches the Detroit River and ultimately makes it into Lake, um, Lake Erie? And so for that, he used a very sophisticated model where, as I said, it couples the hydrodynamics. It's a shallow lake, so sedimentary suspension events are quite important. And he coupled it to a phosphorus biogeochemical models. And again, taking into account the possibility that some of that phosphorus then gets buried in the sediments and retained in, uh, in Lake Sinclair. And what he found is that for the particular year he was simulating, about 40% of the total phosphorus load that the Thames River was delivering to Lake Sinclair actually stayed in Lake Sinclair. And the other 60% ultimately then uh, are able to go to the Detroit River and ultimately reach the western basin of Lake Erie. But you see that the, essentially from a biogeochemical viewpoint, from a sink source viewpoint, Lake St. Clair acts a lot like, for instance, uh, the Fanshawe Reservoir, by essentially providing an opportunity to retain, to eliminate some of the phosphorus from the water flow, and therefore essentially, to a certain extent, you could say benefit then the downstream uh, system, which in this case is Lake Erie. So let's look now at Lake Erie. So again, we have Lake St. Clair was over here. So now we go down the Detroit River. We end up in the Western Basin, which of course is well known because of the problems with cyanobacterial tail blooms. But I want to uh, <clears throat> draw your attention to the circulation here, say in the Central Basin. What you see is these surface currents that tend to hug the coastline, both on the Canadian side and the US side. And essentially these are along shore uh, currents that essentially what they do is to take that near shore water mass and keep it close to the shore. Now, of course, there are interactions and exchanges between the uh, near shore waters and the offshore waters, but essentially the water, a water parcel can travel a very long distance, say up to 100 kilometers, by essentially not leaving that coastal area. We see something similar also in, uh, in the eastern basin. So for a long, for a significant portion of the year, what we see is that water, near shore water, tends to stay close to the shore and be transported mostly from west to, uh, to east. So that's what I want to deal with. And also here give a, um, a recent publication by a group at Environment Canada, where they actually look specifically at the intensity of these near shore, offshore interactions. But we can think about the system as, or the, the, these basins, particularly the, the central and the eastern basins, as comprising the offshore waters and then these near shore waters that are kept there 
by the circulation patterns. So what we did is we took a very simple approach at this point. I mean, these are very preliminary results where we said, okay, let's look at um, the phosphorus dynamics. Let's see what we can say about the phosphorus dynamics in the near shore zone that we define here as uh, water depths less than 15 meters. We've done similar calculations by putting it 19 meters rather than 15 meters. And then the offshore waters are the waters that are deeper than 15 meters. In that approach, of course, the Western Basin, which is very shallow, ends up being one big near shore area. So let's start from the, um, the, the total phosphorus budget for the three basins. So now, for the moment here, the near shore zones and the offshore zones are taken together. And if we start at the Western Basin, the 7,619 million tons per year uh, that are coming in from external loading, that's what comes down the Detroit River, plus all the tributaries to the Western Basin, including the Maumee River, for instance. And it's all you, all you need to look at here is the, the, the magnitude of the number. So we have a big number, enters the Western Basin. A significant that, uh, fraction of that here in the purple arrow is essentially what is being retained in the basin by burial and sediments. But a larger amount or larger fraction here, this 5,218, is actually transferred to the central basin. In addition, the central basin gets its own external supply from tributary rivers and from a little bit from atmospheric deposition. A fraction of that gets deposited and ultimately buried in sediment. But again, a largest fraction of what comes in, or a large fraction of what comes into the central basin, is actually transferred to the eastern basin. Eastern basin also gets some river tributaries and a little bit of atmospheric deposition. For instance, this would be part of that is what the Grand River delivers to the eastern basin of Lake Erie. Well, a little bit or some, some fraction gets buried and then we have the outflow to the Niagara River to Lake Ontario. But if you look at the magnitude of the numbers here, you will see that the biggest numbers, say if you take for instance central basins, the biggest numbers are actually associated with the interbasin exchanges. In other words, the central basin gets more phosphorus from the western basin than it gets from its own uh, river tributaries. So let's now focus on these, um, these interbasin exchange and also look at the outflow here to Lake Ontario. And ask the question, well, how these exchanges, how much of that actually goes to the near shore zones versus how much actually goes directly to the offshore zones? <clears throat> and so that's what we've done, tried to do here. And as I said, these are preliminary numbers. They're probably going to change, but the relative magnitudes are probably not going to change very much. So the Western Basin transfers on average about 5,000 million tons of phosphorus per year. And what we found, at least in our calculations, is that more than 80% of that actually directly goes to the near shore zones, both on the Canadian side and the US side, and then moves from west to east towards the eastern basin. And only 17% goes directly to the offshore. We see something very similar for the central basin where the, of the total amount of phosphorus transferred from the central basin to the eastern basin, most of it actually goes directly to the near shore zones and is then stuck in this near shore uh, circulation uh, loop. And 13% goes to the offshore. In addition, most of this 87% here actually comes from the near shore zones of the central basin. So there's a strong connectivity between the near shore zone of the western basin and that of the east, from the central basin and the eastern basin, sorry. So now if we look at what gets out the Niagara River to Lake Ontario, again, it's mostly fed by near shore waters from the eastern basin. And that's important because the near shore waters have different chemical composition than the offshore water, they tend to be more enriched in phosphorus than the offshore waters. But what this shows here that we have this two system uh, system where we have the near shore compartment and the offshore compartment. And to a certain extent, we can even say that the near shore compartments are more closely hydrologically and biogeochemically connected than they are connected with the offshore waters. All right, <clears throat> we see something similar when we look at sediment phosphorus burial for the Western Basin, as I said, in our approach, that's just one big near shore system. But if you look at the central basin, of all the phosphorus that is being buried in the central basin, where we find that the majority actually ends up in the near shore zone, 57%. Now, the near shore zone is, of course, much smaller than the offshore zone. So if you normalize to the surface, it means that the burial rates of phosphorus are much larger in the near shore zone than they are in the offshore zone. And we find the same for the eastern basin. But again, it all points out that essentially when we think about the near shore, the littoral zones of Lake Erie, and by extrapolation, other large lakes, they really represent separate biogeochemical systems that are really distinct from the offshore waters. So we need to treat them as, them as their own systems. And then we have to, of course, take into account the exchanges they have with the contributing watersheds and then the exchanges they have 
equity offshore waters. So this then brings me down to the last part, very short, on uh, internal phosphorus loading. Now we go away from the, from the Great Lakes here, and we go all the way to the west here of Ontario to the Experimental Lakes area, or ELA. And so for those of you who might not know what the Experimental Lakes area is, it's an area where we have lakes where we can do experiments. And one of these lakes, the Lake 227, is very famous because before 19, so you can see it's a very nice round lake, the Cayman Shield Lake. Uh, before 1969, it was a very oligotrophic, uh, ultra oligotrophic uh, lake. And in 69, what was decided was to start an artificial fertilization experiment. And from then on, each year up to, to today, each year about 24 kilograms of phosphorus are added to the lake each year. And the lake very quickly within a year switched from these very oligotrophic conditions to becoming a eutrophic lake. And this has been going on since uh, 69. Some years they also added nitrogen, and others they did to change of nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. In the, the, the last few years, as far as I know, only phosphorus has been added. So what we did here was to collect sediment cores, and we dated the cores, so we know uh, what sediment layer to which, which time period it corresponds. And then we did a lot of chemical analysis on trying to figure out under what form the phosphorus was accumulating in the sediments. And because the core are long enough, we have sediment from before 69 and sediments that accumulated since uh, 1969, so since uh, 1969, yeah, since it became uh, eutrophic. And so I won't go to all the data. What I want to show is that because we have now this sediment archive, we were able to reconstruct essentially the phosphorus cycle, or the average phosphorus cycle, before 1969 during the oligotrophic condition. So we were able to kind of estimate the external loading, so the natural pristine external loading, how much gets deposited each year, it's all in kilograms per year. The importance of the internal loading, you can see it's a, it's, a, it's a sizable chunk of compared to the external loading and then how much is actually ultimately buried and accumulates in, in the sedimentary uh, column. Then since the eutrophication experiment started on, of course, the external loading had been massively increased, which of course increased the amount of phosphorus being deposited on the sediments, increased of course the internal loading by a factor of about 5.5, increased the, uh, the burial accumulation rate, of phosphorus and also increase the outflow. But what we found is that over 90% of all the artificially added phosphorus since 1969 actually is still in the lake, but now it's actually in the sediments. So the sediments have been accumulating a lot of phosphorus because of the external addition. But what's, what's probably the most surprising result is that over 70% of all that post-1969 sediment phosphorus actually exists under fairly reactive forms or labile forms, so phosphorus in organic compounds, ternary complexes of phosphate with humic uh, substances, condensed phosphorus compounds like polyphosphates, phosphorus plant iron oxides. So we have this huge legacy, this huge store of fairly reactive phosphorus at the bottom of the lake. So the question is now if we want to return this lake to its pristine pre-1969 uh, state, first of all what you can do is of course reduce the external loading back to the natural loading. But the question then becomes, what about this internal loading? How long is it going to take for this internal loading to essentially bleed out all that reactive phosphorus that has accumulated historically? Well, the calculation we did, it's very simple, back of the envelope calculations, seem to indicate that if we now today terminate the artificial phosphorus additions, it would still take many decades, probably more than five to six decades, for the internal phosphorus loading to return to its pre-1969 level. So what this means says that yes, you can, of course, the external loading is something that we can manipulate, of course, in an experiment, that's, that's what was manipulated. What we cannot as well manipulate unless we do very, very serious uh, engineering stuff is this internal loading. And so what we have here is essentially something that Mandita talked about uh, last week, these legacies in the landscape. But what we also have is, of course, historical legacies within the lakes under the form of the sedimentary reservoir. And we've done <clears throat> other work on a lake in Norway and we find the same thing there. We actually found that this memory effect of the internal loading would last up to 200 years. So that's something to take into account when we think about, hey, how are you going to restore a eutrophied lake? Uh, how does this apply to large lakes like Lake Erie? That is still something that we need to uh, do much more work on. Okay, so this leads me then to the kind of concluding messages. First of all, I hope to have convinced you that river damming represents one of the major anthropogenic modifications of the cycles of water and nutrients on land. 
that the processes in the reservoirs decouple river nutrient fluxes. In particular, it leads typically to more elimination of phosphorus than nitrogen. So it tends to promote phosphorus limitation of primary production in the downstream aquatic ecosystems. For the example of Fanshawe Reservoir, we saw that up to, to, to on something like 40% plus minus 20% of total phosphorus is retained uh, in the reservoir, but this retention is strongly signal dependent. And what we found for it actually, the, the reservoir becomes a net source of total phosphorus to the river system. And also, which is probably more problematic, it increases the bioavailability of that phosphorus. And we can certainly see this in reservoir by geochemical processing when we look at these concentration discharge relationship, which completely changes between the inflow to the reservoir and the outflow of the reservoir. And we also saw that about 40% of the TP load of the Thames River is retained in Lake St. Clair, again, under the form of burial in the sediments. That the phosphorus budgets of the basins of Lake Area are dominated by interbasin exchanges that the near shore zones of Lake Area exhibit strong hydrological and biogeochemical connectivity. In other words, they form a distinct biogeochemical compartment separate from the offshore water. And that, of course, has implication how we develop and set up uh, models, whole lake models uh, for uh, Lake Area or for large lakes in general. Half of the external TP loading to Lake Area is buried in sediments. So we have a legacy builder and the other half is exported to Lake Ontario. And in the central and eastern basins, approximately half of the phosphorus barrel occurs in the near shore zone. And finally, restoration of eutrophic lakes must take into account this legacy effect of historical accumulation of phosphorus in the sediments. And that's it. So thank you for your attention. And I think now we can switch to the Q&A session. Thank you, Philippe, for that presentation. We will now move to the Q&A portion of the session. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature to post questions you have, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, and we're also interested in your general input and how this work may be useful for your organization. So if you have thoughts on this, we also encourage you to use the chat feature to engage in that discussion. So Philippe, we'll get started with some questions. So the first question is, some summer algal populations seem to have played no role in reducing phosphate heat in the water column. Do you have an explanation for why? I'm not sure I understand your question. You say some don't eliminate phosphorus. Um, I think we, we probably have to look at, <coughs> sorry, at what time scales you're, you're talking about. Are you talking about, say, the elimination within a few days? Then clearly it might indicate that those populations might be limited by something else than, uh, than phosphorus. Because of course, you don't have only phosphorus limitation. We can be limited by other macro and micronutrients, can be limited by light conditions. Uh, you have predation uh, forcings so or top-down forcings also. Um, on a longer time scale, <clears throat> I think what's important is, of course, uh, some algal biomass degrades more easily than other. So the return, the recycling of, uh, of nutrients from the uptake by the algae back to the, to the water column can also differ from algal uh, community or algal species to other algal species. Uh, so there's of course a lot of complexity involved with how algae live, die, um, go up and down the water column. Uh, <clears throat> that's not really my specialty, so I won't go too far. But yeah, I mean, certainly if you look at the very, so most of my presentation here was kind of on the more longer time scales. We're talking about annual, seasonal, decadal thing. Um, but on a very much shorter time scale, of course, if you're interested in knowing whether you're gonna have an algal bloom tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, that requires a much deeper understanding of the biology of the organisms and also the fine scale hydrodynamic hydrodynamics of the system. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is, why is less phosphorus going into the sediment in the eastern basin of Lake Erie compared to the western and central basins? Yes, so the, the numbers I showed were total numbers. Now the eastern basin is much smaller than the central basin. So even if you had have the same amount of accumulation per square meter, you would have already a difference. So 
in fact, I should have probably shown numbers, both the total numbers and then the numbers normalized by surface area. But <clears throat> one of the reasons is also that the um, that there is a depth water depth dependence on burial efficiency. So typically, if you have if you have um, if you have a deep uh, east the, the, the deepest basin is the eastern basin. If you have a deep basin, as the biomass settles down to the bottom, a lot of that actually gets mineralized in the water column. And so there's more processing already taking place on the, when as the, the, the biomass or the dead biomass is settling down than when in, in the shallow western basin. So the, 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 the depositional conditions are different and the amount of processing in the water column are different. There's also morphological uh, aspects involved because the, the eastern basin is fairly, fairly deep and sharp. And so there's also some, uh, some sediment focusing going on. And then there is also the efficiency at which phosphorus gets uh, exported down the Niagara River to, uh, to Lake Ontario. So all these factors will play a role why these numbers are different. But the first thing that you, that you need to think about is that Eastern Basin is the small basin. So, and I just gave you total numbers um, in, in the figure I just showed you. Great. Next, we've got a question. Um, in terms of the differences between nearshore and offshore pea retention in Lake Erie, what was the main driver here, do you think? Is there a big difference in pea speciation? And what are the controlling species? There is probably uh, differences in the pea speciation. Unfortunately, and that's been a little bit my frustration, is there's, not, there's a little bit that's been done, and particularly in the Western Basin but not so much in, in the other basin. There's been some uh, in, interesting work done by Peyton, but if you look, for instance, how much work has been done on speciation, accumulation rates uh, in the Great Lakes, <clears throat> it's actually very little compared to what the, the amount of literature you find on, say, near shore marine environments or even the deep sea, where a lot of work has been done in that respect. So I think this is, to me, kind of still the unknown frontier in Lake Erie or Great Lakes research. Um, there's, of course, uh, Sergei Katsev in Duluth at the University of Minnesota, who is doing a lot of that work, but he's mostly working in uh, Lake Superior and Lake Huron. But the lower Great Lakes, I think there's a lot of opportunity there to start using some of the techniques, some of the work we've done in, for instance, Lake 227, or a lot of the work that's done in, uh, in deep sea environments or near shore marine environments, where we know much more about the speciation. But, Phosphorus preservation in sediments is a whole, depends on the speciation, depends also on the processing that happens before it actually deposits it at the, at, the, at the lake floor in the water column itself. And so, because you have different forms of phosphorus in the water column, in the nearshore part, in the offshore part, the sources of phosphorus to the sediments are already different. So I would certainly, that's part of the explanation why we see these differences in, um, in burial efficiency or burial rates if we think in terms of normalized by surface area. So there's a lot that happens there, but I think it's still an open field. To me, that's a big knowledge gap in the research on nutrient, it's not just phosphorus, it's silicon, it's, it's nitrogen, it's carbon. We, there's still a lot of work that could be done there. Um, that unfortunately, I'm, I'm coming from the marine side. In the marine world, looking at phosphorus and nitrogen, carbon speciation, and sediment, something that is done very frequently and has been shown to be very successful in uh, interpreting the long-term evolution of, of systems. Great. Um, next, we have an interesting question. What do you think is the potential for removing sediments from reservoirs to use as an agricultural fertilizer? I think we should certainly look into it <clears throat> because it is, it, it's not so much that, that you will have high concentrations of phosphorus in, in these sediments, uh, but uh, <clears throat> this goes back to uh, a few years where actually there, there was, we had a day trip to um, Conestoga Lake and I collected some of the sediment. It was not a very deep sediment, put it in my garden. It worked pr beautifully. I mean, the flowers were beautiful. There was lots of growth. So I think it's, it, is, it is certainly a possibility. The main concern is, of course, that you don't just accumulate phosphorus. You also accumulate other potentially bad things like pesticides or, 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 or other uh, contaminants. And so you have to be careful that you, of course, and that's the same 
is exactly the same questions that arise when we think about using, for instance, the, the leftovers of wastewater treatment plants as a fertilizer. But I think ultimately in thinking about a circular economy of phosphorus, we'll have to take that as a possibility. Uh, from time to time, also reservoirs need to be dredged, and so that would be one opportunity. Uh, so there will be a cost associated with it, so we need to ask an economist to kind of give us a cost estimate of judging it, processing it, putting it on land versus essentially using fertilizer or artificial fertilizers of phosphorized fertilizers. But I think I would, I would certainly, I would never ever exclude it as a possibility because, yeah, it's, it's good for the downstream environment, but it could also be good for basically growing plants and food in, uh, on land. Great, thanks, Philippe. Our next question is from Matthew Child. He wonders if you can comment on the relative role of Lake Erie hydrodynamics versus the Dreisenid nearshore shunt in nearshore nutrient enrichment. I'm not even going to try to answer that question. <laughs> it's a 50 50 thing. You know. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I think the, um, the, the, the muscles, the colonization by muscles, really fundamentally changes how the exchange between water column and sediment happens. So the numbers that I presented were some kind of average numbers over like, I think it was Zaire used about 16 years of, of data. So clearly if the near shore sediment burial is such an important part of the phosphorus cycle in Lake Erie, if you start covering this by, uh, by mussels, clearly you're gonna modify the, um, the ability of the sediments to basically recycle or bury phosphorus. So I think it's certainly very, very important. The hydrodynamics will be very important in terms of controlling the exchanges between the near shore and the offshore. And also will be very important in terms of uh, redistributing uh, the phosphorus from one uh, basin to the other basin. So again, the numbers I showed, we are orders of magnitude. So one year, you might have a lot of the phosphorus going to the near shore zone from one basin to the other basin. The other year, it might be less. Uh, so I don't think I would put a number on the relative importance. I think they're both obviously very important, uh, particularly for large lakes. Hydrodynamics are extremely important because th their circulation patterns are very complex. Um, the one that I showed was just one snapshot. I mean, if you look at another snapshot, it looks very different. So I think the whole lake functioning obviously is driven largely by the hydrodynamics. What the desonate muscles will do is basically change the ability of the sediments to bury the phosphorus or to recycle the phosphorus and therefore will also play a very important role and some studies have been done on that so there's the shunt hypothesis etc but again the fact that it's still a hypothesis to a certain extent shows that certain people are working on it but i think there's much much more potential to do much more work on essentially water column sediment exchanges and what they mean in terms of both the short term but also the long-term evolution of the system Great, so we are nearing the end of our hour together. So we're gonna try and squeeze in one last question. Um, this is a specific question from Keith Reed about slide 23. So I don't know if you wanna flip back to that one while I ask the question. This question is, is all of the change in DP to TP ratio due to the release from bottom, and bottom sediments? Or is there also a difference in the seasonal loading of particulate phosphorus to the reservoir? The answer is yes. That's a short answer. I think the, the, um, the, the internal loading or the, 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 the really the massive importance of the internal loading in the summer is probably the longest. I can't see the number of my slides, so I don't know which. Is it this one? Or yes, it... this one. This one. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I think this is part of the explanation at the load discharge. Uh, but yeah, the, the, there is also a seasonal variation in the, the speciation or the different forms of phosphorus entering. So the external loads are changing both in terms of total loads, but also in terms of the, the speciation. Because during a high discharge, typically you entrain a lot of particulate phosphorus. So the answer is yes, that plays a role. But the real departure at the very low discharges, that is mostly a summer stratification effect. Great, so thank you to everyone who asked questions. I apologize that we were not able to get to all of them. Um, but I wanna thank everyone for participating today. And we hope our discussion here has been insightful.
So we'd like to end with uh, one last poll. So Nancy, if you wouldn't mind starting the poll. Um, we want to know if you learned something today. So let us know, yes, no, or not sure yet. We will leave that for a moment for you to contemplate. And looking at the results, that's great. 93% of folks did learn something new. So that's very encouraging for us. Um, so to wrap up, we have one more webinar upcoming in this series that is scheduled, that is scheduled for next week, same time, um, with Roy Brower, who will discuss his research on people's willingness to pay for water quality improvements in the Great Lakes on both sides of the border. And that is Wednesday, August 12th. Registration for that is now open. And then after that, we'll, we will be taking a brief summer break um, and resume again in September. So keep your eye on your email and our, our Twitter feed for more information on that. Um, in the meantime, we will also be sending you a follow-up email with a recording of this webinar. And there will also be a brief survey directly after this webinar. Filling it out would really help us improve um, the value of future webinars. So we would appreciate if you could take a quick moment to do that. Um, thank you, Philippe, again for your presentation and for your insightful answers to our audience's questions, um, to our participants. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Have a great rest of your afternoon, everybody. Bye.